Okay, folks, so thank you very much for tuning in to this broadcast. Like I say, I hope you can all hear me okay. This is aimed at those golfers who have just started playing in the last, say, year or so, or you haven't yet started taking up the game, and I aim to inspire you to give it a go. Too many times I see posts on Facebook, on Instagram from businesses within the golf industry, certain social media profiles saying that golf is hard. And it really frustrates me because it's not hard to start playing golf. It's not hard to go out and enjoy just playing golf with your friends and family. But yes, it is hard if you want to turn pro. It is hard if you want to go and win majors on tour. But just to go out and play the game, is it's never been easier. The golf courses now are a lot more open and welcoming for you to go and have a game. There's facilities like ours here at June's that can lend you clubs and you can come and just for the cost of a basket of balls, go and hit some shots. You can pick up used secondhand golf clubs now for just a very, very small price. Yes, of course, you can spend thousands of pounds on it but it is also very accessible now for the whole family to enjoy. And that is really my mission is to get more people playing golf. And this is going to be a 30 to 40 minute presentation where I'm just going to give you some simple tips. So if you were thinking about coming to the range to give it a go, at least you've got something constructive you can work. And I'm also going to present a couple of myths that are doing the rounds that are really holding back people from playing better golf. So that's how I'm going to start today. So I here have got a 7 iron. I'm going to explain a little bit more about clubs, but I'm not going to get too technical this evening. My mission is to give you some really simple pointers. In fact, if you are an existing golfer who's been playing for a number of years, I'm confident you'll get something out of this evening that might just simplify the whole game for you. I think in my time, 24 years I've been a golf pro, that I certainly with my own game have overcomplicated it. I've seen a lot of people come to me for lessons where they've tied themselves in knots because they're thinking so, so much about it. And we can really simplify that. We can chuck out all of the rubbish that's going on and just get back to the basics. And that's what I hope to do this evening. So what I'm going to start off with um, is just some little demonstration and an explanation. Uh, number one is when I see people first start playing, they, they hit a lot of shots from the bottom of the club or the club comes in. I don't know if you can see this very well. Billy, you'll have to give me a shout. Can you see this okay? Where we hit the top of the ball. And the reason why so many golfers hit the top of the ball when they start playing is because they're trying to help the ball up into the air. In fact, Billy, if you could just scoot round and look over the front of the bay here, this will test your camera skills, son. So can you get the, the camera high enough so they can see me and... The ball, yeah. How we're we looking? <laughs> we done it. Good lad. So what they try and do as they swing in, they're trying to help the ball up in the air, trying to scoop it up because they know that when they see golf being played, when you're hitting anything other than a putt, we want to see the ball going up in the air. So one of the first things we need to do is to resist that temptation to try and help the ball up. If you imagine a footballer kicking a ball. If he's going to sky it over the crossbar, he's going to lean back. Well, we've got to get rid of that temptation. And the first way I'm going to do that is to remind you that all these golf clubs have this angled face that we call the loft. And it's from the face here that we need to endeavour to strike the golf ball. Billy, if you want to come back down the line, please, and just set yourself up there. Doing a great job, son. Thank you. So... A good way we can help you to do that is this. I want you to imagine the golf swing is a giant circle. So you can see the club head tracing this big circle back and forth around my body. A good analogy for it is one where you imagine that you've got a giant polo mint, a really big polo mint, and you are stood in the hole of the mint, and the mint is tilted back at this sort of an angle here. So it's not straight up and down. It's on this slight angle. And you're just going to swing the shaft and the head of the club back and through on the outside of that giant polo mint. Yeah? 
So we've got that polo mint analogy. Now at the bottom here, where the ball will be, is what we call our low point. Okay, the low point of your swing. And all good golfers have a great control of where that low point is. Okay, now just before I talk a little bit more about a game you can play on low point, I'm going to dispel myth number one. So there's a lot of golfers out there when they think about this circle, they see professionals playing and they think that it is absolutely vital that you keep your left arm straight. A lot of what I talk about this evening, folks, is going to be geared towards a right-handed golfer. So if you are left-handed and you're playing golf the other way around, please forgive me. We'll just reverse whatever I'm saying. So as a right-handed golfer, a lot of golfers get this advice that you've got to keep the left arm straight. And it's a fallacy. It actually causes more harm than good. I would much sooner have it where you're just focusing on swinging on this wide circle as opposed to trying to keep the left arm straight. Because what happens is I see this. Someone gets told, keep your left arm straight. So they go, right, that's straight. Now, this is like a rock. And then they swing the club like this. And it gets all overextended. There's no flow. There's no rhythm. And it causes no end of bad shots. So whilst you might see many golfers keeping the left arm relatively straight, you'll notice in mine, there's a little bit of softness here as well that allows me to swing the club freely. It's certainly not here, but it's not rigidly straight. I would much sooner you focus on just keeping a nice width, going back to that circle, rather than trying to focus on keeping this rigidly straight. Now, on to a little challenge um, I would like you to do. So I talked about low point of the swing arc. So where's that club coming down? Where is the low point on our swing and how low is it? Because for us to hit the ball out of the middle of the club, we're looking at striking it some three or four grooves up the face here. So if we're hitting a shot off the floor, we need to make sure we make some contact on the ground in order to strike the ball out of the middle. So, again, when you're out playing, if you're on a mat, it is perfectly normal. It is actually required for you to make some contact on the mat. When you're out on the golf course, if you're using an iron or you're on the grass, it's perfectly fine to take a divot, a little bit of grass that comes out. Now, that low point should ideally be just after the ball when we're hitting an iron. So we're actually gathering the ball on the slight downward arc. But there's two ways we can do that. And I'm going to use a bit of this stuff here. This is called lie angle tape. Now at Junes, we have this stuff in abundance because the, the companies keep sending us this because this is a way that we would fit for lie angle on a golf club. If you don't know what that is, don't worry about it tonight. This is a beginner lesson. But we keep getting sent it, and we've improved our technology in the studio where we actually don't need it anymore. So we let people like you come and take some. So what we do is we give you some of this stuff if you want to come and practice this game. And I call this game the North, South, East, West game. And it's very much designed to help you to become aware of where your low point is, perhaps of how low your low point is. And it's done in a playful manner because like anything we do very well in our lives, we do it through playing games. We do it when we're having fun. And we particularly do it when it's non-judgmental, especially in a critical way. And if Billy could just turn to see this quote on the range here. Uh, if I read it out while Billy uses his excellent camera work so you can see it. This is one of my favorite quotes. And it's located at this end of the base because this is where I do a lot of my uh, beginner group lessons when we do go on the range and not on the golf course. And it says, if you can't see it, when we give ourselves permission to fail, we at the same time give ourselves permission to excel. So, Billy, if you just come back this way. So what that means is that, you know, as we become adults, I think we're a lot more fearful of things going wrong. When I look at the kids hitting balls, they just get and they just give it a whack and they see what happens and they give it another whack and they're excited about what they can explore. Whereas in my adult classes, I can see there's a lot more nervousness around doing it wrong. 
And when there's that fear of doing it wrong, it actually inhibits your learning. So let me show you the north, south, east, west game. Bill, if you can get down on the, uh, to show the mat here. This triangle tape is sticky. And as you can see here, it is stuck to the mat. And what I want you to do is we're going to set up with the back of the tape roughly in the center of our stance. I'll cover ball position in a short while. And as we set up to the tape, I want you to make a swing. And I want you to, first of all, deliberately try to miss the tape. Deliberately try to miss it. But what you're going to do is we're going to reference where we miss it. This side, for me, as I look at it, would be north. This would be south. This is east. And this is west. So I take a set. I think, right, I'm going to try and hit the mat north of the tape, which I did there. Then I'm going to go and try and miss it to the south. Now, when I do this, I don't move my positioning from the tape. And that's quite key. I want you to stay in the same position because, of course, I could just go, well, I'm going to miss it north by standing in really close. Or when I miss it south, I'm going to stand over here to make it easier. The idea of standing in the same place is you will actually find if you get a place where you know you could miss it from either of those four compass points, you're more than likely going to be in the ideal distance away from the ball. Then, of course, I want you to swing and feel like you're going to miss it to the east and then swing and feel like you're going to miss it to the west. What you are doing here is you are creating an awareness of where this club head is in time and space. And it's a learned skill. You get better at it the more you do it. So many golfers out there are blissfully unaware of where the low point of their swing is or how deep it is. And that's the other advantage of this bit of tape is because it's so thin, if you focus, when you then go to the tapes, you've played the North, South, East, West game a number of times. You've got better at it. But of course, we need to be able to hit the tape. But the fact that you've been able to deliberately move, and by the way, you're not going to be as good as I am at that straight away. There's going to be times where you try to swing and miss it to the north and you just can't do it. But I promise you, give yourself a bit of time to figure it out. If you do that, you will get it. And the last thing you need at this stage is somebody coming in and interrupting you and saying, oh, do this, do that, do this with your hands, do this with your grip. If you practice this alone, where you're free from judgment and you can just see what happens. How can I explore? If you have that attitude that I know I can do this, you just need to find access to it. Then you'll come up with some great answers very, very quickly. So going back to the low point, the depth of it, the advantage of the tape is it's nice and thin. And if my objective here, if you can just get down the camera onto the tape, Billy, really, if I'm swinging and I know, as I've already explained, to hit the ball out the middle of the club, we need to make some contact on the ground, okay? If that club's flying through the air, if it's like an aeroplane coming into land, but it never touches the runway, then we're only going to ever top the ball or what we call thin it, which is where we hit the equator of the ball at best. So we've got to get that club to land, but there's two ways I could do that. Going back to the aeroplane analogy, I could oh, crash land the club. I definitely made contact on the map there, but it was so sharp and descending my chances of getting a good, consistent outcome are almost zero. So we're going back to the circle analogy, the giant polo mint. We want the base of our swing, the low point of the arc here, as it's striping the ground, to be shallow so that we can just gather that bit of tape away. Look, and You'll see it often just sticks to the face. So I can reuse it. Now, again... As I've already said, the reason I'm a golf pro is because I've got good control of where my low point is, so I know I can make this look easy. When you have a go, you will miss it. If you did have somebody watching you, it can be useful to ask them where you missed it if you weren't sure. An example would be sort of like, like oh, that happened so quick, you might not be aware of where that missed. Was it the far side, north? Was it south? Was it east? Was it west? And somebody who's watching might say, well, actually, that looked like it was south. Now, you can use that feedback because it's accurate. We're not saying missing south was wrong, by the way. It's just what it is. So you can go from that and go, right, I'm going to have another go. And you swing until you start to get it. And if you do that, I promise you, 
you'll start to get the ball in the air every single time. If we just go back down the line, please, Bill. So, just going to hit some shots. So, what I would recommend we do, and, uh, and for the record, anyone who has been playing for some time and they're struggling to, to hit the ball with anything other than either heavy, which is where we hit the ground before the ball, or if we hit in the top of the ball, then just be mindful of where is the low point of your swing arc. Because in both those instances, it's more than likely either too high or it is what we would describe as east of the ball. It's coming back here. And just by focusing on how can I swing to get my low point west of the ball, so what we would call target side of the ball, you'll find that your body makes different movements, but without it being so conscious. In other words, your conscious thought is on where am I going to put the low point of the club? Your subconscious mind, the part of the mind that does the good stuff, yeah, the part of the mind that helps you to move more freely without thinking about it too much, will take over and position your body accordingly. Billy, I think on the stream yard it will come up with any questions. I don't know if anyone's um, said anything yet. If they do, keep an eye on it and just give me a shout and I'll answer those, uh, those questions people might have. So... Let's just see where I'm at with my list of things I wanted to talk about. That's right. So a little tip on ball position for you. So any of you don't know what I mean by that. When I set up to the ball, I can position it here. So this would be in front of my left foot more. No, no, you're okay there, Billy. Um, in front of my left foot, that's fine. Um, that would be called putting the ball position forward in my stance. The opposite would be having the ball back in my stance. And then, of course, somewhere in between, which we would call the middle of the stance. Now, there are ways we can move about the ball position, but keeping this simple, remember I said it's an easy game to play. When you're using an iron, one of these clubs, I would advise just for now, play all of your shots from the middle of your stance. Yeah. So I'm going to hit a couple of shots now. What we've got here is a little black tee peg. Now, if you've just started playing, by all means, put the ball on a tee peg. If you're going to get out on a golf course, which I highly recommend you do as soon as you possibly can, there's nothing to be fearful of, by the way, with this. The rules of golf state that you can use a tee peg for your first shot on each hole. But when you're starting to play, you're not going to be playing competition, so don't worry about it. If you want to put the ball on a tee peg for every shot except to put, then do it. If it's going to make it more fun, it is an important skill to learn to play the shots without a tee peg, but in those early days, it's more motivating, it's more enjoyable if you want to put it on a little tee peg like I've done here. In fact, you could experiment with different tee peg heights because, what's that, Billy? Okay, yeah, Billy's just reminding me that my battery's running low. It's because it's freezing out here, the battery's going to get zapped, so I'm going to make sure I don't overrun this because if the, if the broadcast goes off, it's because the battery's gone. And what I'll do is I'll reconvene tomorrow with what else I was going to say. So I put the ball here on a little tee peg. Now, when you think having that ball on a little tee peg just raises it up, it's giving you some margin for error, much, much easier to hit the middle of the club. So by all means, put the ball on there, ball in the middle, and it's just that circle swing. There we go. So... Moving on from that, um, yeah, move, make sure you don't hit all your shots. If you come to the range, I would definitely mix it up with some shots off the tee peg, some shots off the floor. If we make a swing off the floor and you top it, just remember your low point wasn't low enough. Perhaps take a little practice swing, big circle swing, and hear, listen, feel that contact on the floor. It's a bit like the golf club head is the head of a phosphorus match. And the mat here that I'm on is a match box. And as you're making this swing, I want you to feel like you're going to strike and light that match up. Yeah? Light the match. Hear that noise. There's a difference. Listen carefully. I hope you can hear this back home. What was that? That was a thud. 
that vibrated, that kind of hurt my hands a little bit. Not too bad. It's not a painful thing, but you can feel that twang through the hands as opposed to that, that skiff as we light the match on the mat. And when we do that, that's when we're going to get those good strikes. Practice is going to really help. It's not an instant thing, but it can come very quickly when you're in the right environment where there's not negative judgment all of the time. So moving on, we're going to talk about setup a little bit. So I don't want to overcomplicate this at all, folks, because I believe you can use the power of visual learning to perhaps at home use a window or a mirror and success, you know, leaves clues. So if you just watch a bit of golf on TV, if you see people you know, if you watch what I do, you can see how someone who's a pretty good player sets up to it, the sort of athletic posture that they adopt. I wouldn't advise you get into complexities of exact positions. Just kind of just act it out. Now, I was a junior at Scarborough Northcliffe, and when I was a junior member there, the TV room had a massive window that overlooked the putting green. And I would spend ages just looking at myself. I wanted it to look like Nick Faldo looked when I saw him on the telly with this posture. And I just kind of faked it, just got in that position. And then I'd make swings that kind of looked like the good players did. And before long, that became my swing. I didn't have to think too much about it. I was just being a bit of a copycat. It was basically taking a model that already works. And it can be any golf. It might be a golf who's got a similar body type to you. It doesn't really matter. It's the basic concepts. You're still going to own your swing. But rather than complicating it, just look at how they tend to set up. When we're here at the range, you won't see this, but behind where Billy is, there's mirrors on our range base. And I can look in there. That's where I'm looking now. And I can just check out my setup. It's not a big you know, thing, as opposed to, say, how I see a lot of amateurs set up, which is they're like this. Yeah. And this setup brings me on to myth busting number two, which is, and this is the most common thing I hear and I've heard all my PGA golfing life. And it goes from well meaning amateur golfer to another amateur who's just started playing. And there is a common belief out there that every time you hit a bad shot, it's because you've lifted your head. And it's usually, it'll be something like this. So someone sets up and say, before they even swing, they get told, keep your head down. So, okay. So now look at my posture. Does it look like that of the golf pros, Billy? No. Okay, look a bit like a hunchback, Billy. You don't know what a hunchback is? Okay, I'll show you. It looks like this. Okay. And then what happens is they make a swing and they're going to keep the head down. and Look at the restricted movement. But did I keep my head down? Billy, speak to me. I did. Thanks for the enthusiasm. Yes, I kept my head down, but I topped the ball. Now, I guarantee you, if you are one of these golfers that's ever done that, the person, it could be granddad, it could be dad, it could be a husband, it could be a wife, it could be any well-meaning friend or family member. They don't mean to be sabotaging you, but they will say, Pete, you lifted your head. And I'm like, sure, I didn't, but okay, well, they're a better golfer than me, so they must be right. So I get my head down even more. And I swing and I'm trying to keep my head down. But the problem is it doesn't allow me to make the big circle swing and to get into that position. Remember what I said, success leaves clues. And so when we look at where good golfers finish, watch where I finish this swing. And I want you to pay particular attention to where I am faced when I'm finishing. So I'm going to hit this shot and then ask Billy to move the camera. But watch my finish. See where I am here. And Billy, if you go to the face on view, the difference between the head down brigade is what happens is they get here and because they're trying to keep the head down, it becomes all arms. And the body doesn't rotate. And if the body doesn't rotate, the arms buckle like this. And when the arms buckle up, where does the club head go? It goes up. And when it goes up, it goes into the top of the ball. Watch instead here as I swing here. Watch where... I finish the swing. In particular, pay attention to my head in the swing. Look where I finish. My body, my chest is rotated to the target. So again, 
if you're not yet out on the golf course, you can do wonders for your golf by acting out the swing at home. You could get a wooden spoon. You don't even need anything in your hands. And you can just make some swings at home. Circle swing, the polo men, and then turn through and finish and pretend that you're the greatest golfer in the world. Yeah, just act out that finish, that speed to balance, looking at the shot you've just hit with great admiration as you see it sail down the fairway. Yeah, you can really get into this movement. I'm going to tell you a very quick story about a coach. and I, Unfortunately, I need to find out the name. And he was charged with the task many, many years ago. I think it was when the James Bond film Goldfinger was being filmed. And it was at a golf club, I think, called Stoke Poges down south. And he was charged with the task of teaching the then James Bond, forget who it was, because there was a golf scene where Bond was playing golf. And the directors didn't need him to be able to hit shots. They could edit in the ball flight. They just needed to make it look like James Bond could play. So this coach was teaching this James Bond actor about just good sets up, showing him a setup, and then a swing that was pretty much what I'm talking about here today. Now, they didn't hit any balls. This is the key thing. They weren't hitting balls. They weren't getting frustrated. It was all very much just acted out. But then, of course, he was like, we well, might as well put a ball there. They put a ball there, and this guy had hardly played any golf before, and boom, he's made this swing finished in the pose and whew, the ball was flying. I think there's a lot in that. So at this time of year, you might not quite be ready for going out on the golf course. It's just started raining again now. You could do this at home, acting out that swing, holding the pose. So your brain is starting to forge those pathways into how to swing to play this game really well. If you come back down this way, please, Billy. So... The, uh, the next thing I want to talk about then is with some practice, you're going to get hit in the ball out the middle of the club. You're going to get that ball going up in the air. But it might not always, of course, be going where you want it to. So what I want you to, again, we're going to play a game. And we the best games we play, again, I've already said, and I'm going to keep repeating it because I believe strongly in how we learn best, which is we play without judgment. It's almost you make a shot, and if it's a bad shot, the thoughts are, oh, that's quite interesting. So I've got this alignment stick. And the reason I've got this is purely for you guys on the camera. If I place this over here and stick it in the ground, this is just a reference for target. So out on the range here, in the absence of you having a stick, you could use one of the flags or one of the tires just to give you a point to aim for. And what I'd like you to do when you're hitting some shots is just be aware of where does it go relative to your intended target. So I'll give you an example. So if my objective was to hit it over this stick here, but I found that the ball kept going to the left, I would ask you to say, well, how could you make it go to the right? What would you do to make it go to the right? Where I don't tell you what to do. You figure out, well, how can I make it go to the right? What would I do differently and to explore those options that you've got of how you could do it. And what you'll find is that by going off to the right and then deliberately to the left, a bit like the North, South, East, West game, is you'll find out those extremes and be able to bring it in. But let's look at how we can uh, talk about why the ball goes off there. And it's a fantastic little exercise I like to do that I came up with one day before a junior lesson about four or five years ago. And we call this part of the club we've got the grip the shaft we've got the hosel this bit's called the shank or heel this is the toe this is the sole of the club and this bit here is the club face and i was just thinking how do i explain these parts to a, a new junior golfer and what i did is i drew with here i've got a whiteboard pen and i just drew a club face now, this is particularly cool because I talked about the middle of the club. The middle of the face and the bit we want to hit the ball out of is the nose. That's the center of the club. So when you think of that, when we're swinging the club, we're going to try and get the nose onto the ball. It just simplifies it. Remember, my promise this evening was to simplify this game that so many people have overcomplicated. There's often people look at me and go, why did the ball go left? 
at impact, when your club touches the ball, the ball will go wherever the eyes of the club face are looking. So, Billy, good idea. Come and uh, come into the bay and just over the... Uh, see if you can see this, if you can get this on the camera, if you can look down low enough. Can you get it or not? You got it? Say so what, you've, you've found your job, mate. You're going to be a cameraman. So the ball will go where the eyes of the club face are looking. So this is looking left. This is looking right. Now, I could start my eyes looking at my target. So in this case, the orange stick. But if that moves in the swing and they come in looking here, then that's where the ball's going to go. The ball doesn't know anything of where you started the club. It just knows where the eyes were looking when you hit it. What have we got left now? 10% battery, is it, Bill? Um, okay. So, Billy, if you just go back down the line. So, I would get you experimenting with deliberately and perhaps have a little sequence of shots where you deliberately try, take your setup, aim the eyes at the stick, and make sure you deliberately hit one left, then deliberately hit one to the right. And then try and hit one straight over your target. And again, it's a game. Yeah, gamify it. Have a bit of fun with it. Don't expect to perfect it straight away. Yeah, but have some fun trying. Now, you can see just if I look here closely where I've struck those shots. But there is an even better way of doing it as well, which is with this stuff. And this is my next top tip. This stuff here. Now, this is Dactar in active spray powder. I haven't yet bought shares in this company, but I should do. Now, the people on the checkout in Tesco think I've got a huge problem because every week I keep going in and buying this stuff, okay? But I don't use it for my athlete's foot, okay? I use it for this. I give the face a little spray, and now after each shot, I can see on the club where I'm hitting it. So I'm going to hit a shot now. Can you get a good picture of that, Bill? There we go. You can really see. Look at that. Now, the advantage of this, what it's going to do, you're going to start to build up a knowledge of how the swing feels or how the contact feels when it comes out of different parts of the club. So what that's going to give you is that feedback that you can then use when you're practicing to go, ah, when it feels like this, it's because I've hit it out of X, Y, or Z. Yeah. Chris, there's some balls here, mate. Loads of balls here. So, sorry, Chris is here giving a lesson and I shut down the computer so he couldn't get any balls out. Anyway, that's another matter. So, yeah, bit of face uh, foot powder spray to help you with strike. Now, I'm going to come back briefly. And this is kind of the final thing because I'm aware that the battery is going to go very soon. So, apologies for this. I've scooted through this a little quicker than I intended to. I want to show you a little bit about how to hold the golf club. It's your only point of contact on the club. And I just want to give you a little insight into it because the hold on the club will influence where this club tends to come in. Okay, so if you've got the eyes of the club face looking left, despite you starting them looking straight, it's probably because of how we're holding the club. Similarly, if it's coming in looking to the right as well. So if you just follow very closely here, starting off with the club face square, what I do, if I let my arms just dangle down, I would observe if I look down at the back of my left hand here, two to three knuckles are visible. Now, you might, I've got a video just on this, so I'll pop a link in the description if this goes a little bit quick. But what we try to do, when we place the left hand on the club, we want to get it where it's going through this part of the hand here that we call the, uh, the heart line. This is the lifeline. The heart line is its deepest crease. So this is the direction the underside of the grip. A lot of people get it here and they sit the handle of the club between these two fleshy parts, the thena and the hyperthena. I can never remember which is which. So my simple explanation is this big pit here of your thumb looks like a chicken drumstick. So it's not the chicken drumstick that sits on the front of the grip. The grip does not sit in this valley, but instead it goes through the direction 
of the heart line. And then it's the other fleshy bit. Let's call it the chicken fillet, not the chicken drumstick, the chicken fillet that sits on the front of the grip. And it will cover the front of the grip of the club. So when Billy's got the camera looking at my hold here now, you cannot see the rubber on the front of the grip. I see so many golfers get the club here and we can see the rubber of the grip. And the problem is with this, as we're swinging, it gets loose, it starts to move and causes a loss of control. A telltale sign if you wear a glove is if you've got a glove wearing a hole here, then that's a warning sign. Something serious is wrong with how you're holding the club. So let's go back to it. Just step back a little bit, Billy. So a reminder, it's through the heart line. Close the fingers and we get the chicken fillet to sit on the front of the grip, leaving just a very bit, small bit of the grip at the top. We don't want to be off the top edge of the club. There's some bad things that happen when we do that as well. I say bad things. It's a game of golf. It's nothing really bad. So left hand on the club. The thumb is going to go just right of center and be slightly shorter. We don't want it extended down the swing. Just bring it up a little bit. And my reference point for those knuckles, you can see the club is square. Two to three knuckles are visible. Once you get the top hand on the club in the right place, the bottom hand is easy. You simply bring it to the club with your fingers down, pull it up, put all your fingers on the rubber of the grip like this, and it fits together, if you can see it's Billy, like a jigsaw. That valley between the thena and the hyperthena, or as I phrased it, between the drumstick and the chicken fillet, just houses beautifully my left hand thumb. And everything is now nicely together. If you look at the back of my hand, it looks like one of those twister lollies, just how my fingers all go around. There's no big gaps like this. It's just nicely together. Now, if you wish, some people may choose to overlap their fingers like so or interlock their fingers. Now, let me tell you, you do not need to do that. You can if you wish. If it helps, you do it. I interlock my fingers because I was told I had to. But I now know that to not be the case. You do not have to, but a lot of people do and they get success with it. Like a lot of the things I'm sharing with you, let's have some fun just experimenting and practicing with this. But let me just run through the grip one more time very quickly. So through the heart line, fingers, chicken fillet on the front of the grip, leaving a little space here. Two to three knuckles visible on the back of the hand and the thumb just right of center and short. We bring the fingers on, get them on the rubber of the grip, the valley here of the right hand houses the left hand beautifully, and that is it. Now, I've talked about the grip. I actually don't like calling this a grip because I think that sends out the wrong messages. To me, a grip is vice-like, and we don't want this to be vice-like. We want to be holding the club. So a good way we can do that before you hit a shot is just waggle the club a few times. Feel the weight in the club. Feel that it's free. Feel that it's not loose, but you've got that ability to create speed in the swing. Balance position. There we go. Battery's gone. What's the matter? Oh, Billy said the battery's about to go. Right, well, I'll tell you what. I think I'm going to finish off there and I'm going to do perhaps some more of these videos in the future. I really hope you've enjoyed that. I hope you've got one or two things. Remember, you can come to the driving range to practice whenever you want. You don't need to be a member of anything. You can just turn up. You can get baskets of balls from £2.50 and just come and give it a go. If you want to borrow uh, Liangle tape that I showed you at the start of the North, South, East, West game, then just come and ask us for it. It's free. We just give you it. We want you to practice with it. All we ask is that when you're finished with it, if there's any bits on the floor, please pick them up and put them in the bin. But we're here to make golf accessible for you. We're here to answer any questions you've got. You all help us to grow if you ask us more questions because we don't know what you don't know. It's so easy for us. And we're aware of this, by the way, folks, that I've been a golf pro now 20 odd years. Chris has been playing golf since he was a little boy, as has Sam, and so has Fergus. So we've been involved in this industry for so long, we forget what we didn't know 20 odd years ago. And we just want to make it easy for you. And, and I, I know as adults, we're often fearful of looking stupid if we don't ask that question that's in our mind, but we don't want to ask it directly because we don't want to look silly. Now, there's only one stupid question and it's the one 
you don't ask. So if you want to ask privately, drop our Facebook page or contact me directly. If there's something that's nagging you that you're not sure about, I would be very grateful if you plucked up the courage and just asked it because that's going to help us to grow so we know what we've got to do more of to try and help make this game easier and more accessible and more welcoming for you just to come and give it a go. I really look forward to seeing you here at June's Golf Centre soon. We've got um, lots of uh, availability now. We're open. Sorry, Billy, what were you saying? Oh, we've got um, times available from 11 till 6 a.m. is our days Monday to Friday, 9 a.m. till 4 p.m. on a Saturday, and 11 a.m. till 4 p.m. on a Sunday. Now, those hours may be extending very soon as well to be later on a night. We're thinking of opening till 8 p.m. If that's something you'd like to see, give us a thumbs up, like the page, do comment. We only get better with your feedback and we do appreciate it greatly. So thanks for watching, folks. If you've got any questions, please do ask and I'll see you soon. Bye for now.